Certificates are everywhere, from AppLocker to NPS policies, from Outlook email signing to Zoom encryption. I'm Paul wojcicki Jarocki, a consultant and for the last 15 years, a Microsoft certified trainer. Some days, a barista. During this session, after a brief introduction to cryptography concepts, we'll take a look inside certificates and at the process of requesting them and then at some practical applications to put these certificates to good use. PowerShell is my tool of choice, but I won't be showing you fancy techniques, just how to harness some available commandlets, system classes, and resources. Speaking of resources, the code that I'll be showing is available on GitHub here under demos. Let's first establish what we're protecting. There's data at rest, like files stored on your drive. There's data in motion, like packets traveling over a network. And data in use, which is less commonly talked about, but includes what's in your RAM or processor registers. Secure strings are data in use. They're encrypted while in memory. Here, you see the convert to secure string commandlet complain that the piped string is already in memory, but unprotected. Now, what are we protecting against? Interception, interruption, modification, and fabrication. But it might be better to look at what we're trying to achieve, the security goals. Confidentiality, the secrecy of our data. Integrity, or knowledge that the data hasn't changed. Authenticity, confirmation of the source of the data, and non-repudiation so that the source cannot deny that they are the source. What can we use to achieve these goals? Cryptography, with computationally secure ciphers based on current assumptions of complexity. You've probably heard these terms, but just to be sure. Plain text is the data, not necessarily text, that we're trying to protect. An algorithm, uh, think of it as a function, is the way to transform the plain text into ciphertext, which is the protected data. And a key is some input into the algorithm that makes it run differently on the plain text. In the Caesar cipher, letters are substituted for other letters of the same alphabet, shifted to the right or left by the number specified in the key. I'll spare you the history lesson. With the advent of electromechanical devices and then later computers, classic ciphers gave way to modern ciphers. Among these, we'll need to differentiate between symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric cryptography, sometimes called shared key or secret key, assumes that all parties that intend to participate in the encryption decryption of data must share a key. This key must be kept secret from anyone else. So the problem? Well, transferring the key securely in the first place. To quickly illustrate how to use symmetric encryption in PowerShell using the advanced encrypting standard that is part of the system security cryptography namespace, I'm going to register my key and my plain text, create my AES algorithm object, register my key, get my plain text into a bytes array format, and then do my encryption. I'll uh, end up with ciphertext that is uh, in an array of bytes. I want to convert that over to something that I can read. And there it is. Decryption is just the reversal. Asymmetric, or public key cryptography, relies on math that is easy done one way, but hard going the other. Multiplication, easy. Factoring, hard. Here, a single party has two keys which cannot be easily derived from one another, and only the private key must be kept secret. The public key can be shared, needs to be shared. Lastly, I must mention hash functions. These validate data by generating a constant length result so that even a single bit of change in the input will produce entirely different output. There's no way to recreate the input based on the output of the hash. That's why they're sometimes called one-way functions. Similar to before, I can get the hash of some data. So let me convert that to an array of bytes. 
And notice here I'm using SHA-2, 256-bit. MD5 and SHA-1 are deemed as unsecure algorithms. Notice that this is always going to be 256 bits in length as output, and this is my hash. Now, if you're doing this for any type of data, very universal, but if you want to do this for a file specifically, there's a get file hash commandlet, which can be used to compare a downloaded file against what the developer has published on their website to check for corruption. So knowing these three things, asymmetric cryptography, symmetric cryptography, and one-way functions, what can we do? Well, let me draw it out for you. This is how encryption works. To be most efficient, we would like to use a symmetric key to encrypt the data and send it over to the recipient. But again, that faces the problem of key distribution. So what we want to do is use a um, you um, uh, use asymmetric cryptography. Now, what's not very intuitive is we do not use our own keys for this. Instead, what needs to happen is we need to retrieve B's, or our recipient's, public key. So, this is B's public key. That is done so that only B with the appropriate private key can decipher that data. So let's take our data, which is going to be some plain text over here. We will encrypt it with the symmetrical key, and that becomes our ciphertext. This can be safely sent across to our recipient. There is no danger to, uh, to uh, this data. So the recipient will receive the ciphertext. But how do we transfer the key? Well, that's the job of B's public key. We use that to encrypt the symmetrical key. So this is going to be the encrypted symmetrical key. And because it's also encrypted, we can send it over to our recipient. That was encrypted with B's um, public key, so only B's private key can be used to decrypt it. What we get? is the symmetrical key. And this can then be used on the ciphertext to retrieve our plain text. It's a kind of convoluted um, procedure, but it gives us the best of both worlds. The speed of symmetrical cryptography, as well as the security of asymmetrical cryptography. The situation changes with signing. Here, we're going to again have some plain text, but when we send it across, we don't really care about uh, making it confidential. Instead, we want to assure the other services, uh, such as non-repudiation or integrity of that message. What we need for this is our own key pair, our um, A's private key, um, that golden one, as well as our public key. Now, the thing about this is our public key has to be distributed in some way. It's going to be sent to B but it can be sent out into the open. It doesn't really matter who else learns about it. 
Asymmetrical cryptography means that only something that was encrypted with uh, the private key can be decrypted with the public key, and only something that was encrypted with the public key can be decrypted with the private key. So, how does all this work? To improve speed, we do not deal with the entire plain text. Instead, we take a hash from that. Now this is then encrypted with our private key to become the encrypted hash. This can be safely sent out to our recipient. As, of course, the plain text out in the open. The recipient wants to verify that uh, the um, plain text was not changed along the way, that the message um, was not um, sniffed, uh, was not snooped, was not, um, was not replaced uh, with anything uh, else by, um, by an attacker. So a few things need to happen. First, the recipient will take the plain text and themselves calculate the hash. Next, they will take the hash that we sent that was encrypted, and since it was encrypted with our private key, they will be able to decrypt it with our public key. That will come up with a hash value. The question is, do these match? If they do, that means that the message was indeed sent by A, and that is signing. A combination of these two techniques allows you to assure both the secrecy and integrity of a message. To sum up, the difference between encryption and signing is whose keys and which type of keys, private or public, are we using. So how do we get the right keys in the first place? That's where certificates come in. Certificates are really just a way of publishing a public key and trusting that the key is issued to the rightful owner. Let's explore the CERT PS drive. In here, we have two certificate store locations, one for certificates given to my computer, the other for my user. In here, we have certificate stores, which differentiate purposes of certificates. Trusted people would contain certificates of others that I communicate with. My certificate store has my own certificates. And here, I have quite a lot. Let me show you that I'm, one that I created recently. This was for the purpose of email signing. Now, to take a closer look inside, let's list a couple of the properties. Let me reiterate, a certificate is a medium for publishing your public key. And that's what we find in here. The public key belongs to the subject. There will be other ways of identifying the owner. We have fields such as not before and not after, which determine the certificate's validity, as well as a couple of extensions, which we'll get to in a moment. The issuer is the signer of the entire certificate. This is someone that we have to trust. As you'll see here, this is the same as the subject which means that this certificate has been self-signed and really has any merit on this local system. Extensions contain extra fields that determine uh, certificate policies, which are really terms of service for usage of a certificate, extra restrictions, extra names. Let's take a look. In my certificate, I have the following extensions. 
the key usage and enhanced key usage, which determine what can this certificate be used for. For example, email signing or code signing or maybe log on with smart cards. The subject key identifier makes it easier to distinguish the right certificate where the same subject string appears in multiple CA certificates. This enumerator allows you to translate those IDs into readable, friendly names. So the certificate will actually contain uh, values recorded as this OID to make it shorter and more precise and less prone to errors. Meanwhile, we humans uh, like to know about the friendly names. You'll notice that this uh, enumerator um, translates both key usage as the type of um, uh, extension, but also the key usage itself. And it goes the other way. So if you want to find out the OID for what code signing is, there you go. Now, OIDs are going to be used to identify um, protocols um, and algorithms. But you can use this same um, structure to identify any data, um, including things that you construct yourself. To be able to use your own OID, you have to register it with the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers. Oh, look there. There's the Grade A Cafe. For the next certificate, I want to retrieve one that I saved when accessing the Microsoft site. And here I'm searching on the subject name. Notice there is an easier way to do this in PowerShell 7.1. Now, this certificate does have a subject name, but it's not uh, the um, just CN Microsoft com that you saw. This has more fields in a distinguished name format. But that's not the only name. So if we look at this extension called the subject alternative name, we'll see that there are more names associated and these include IP addresses or DNS names. They can be used as um, wildcard names as well, uh, covering multiple subdomains. One last name that by default is blank is the friendly name. And this allows you to distinguish uh, different certificates that might have been issued to the same entity, uh, like to one server. Uh, so I always recommend setting this to something. Let's create a certificate ourselves. I'm going to do this with a com object. I'll generate a private key that will be associated with the public key that goes into our certificate. I'll set the subject here, and it will be encoded as a distinguished name. Then I'm going to create the certificate request, make it for a computer. That's uh, how the subject was defined. Encode the request. send the request. Let's check if that succeeded. Yay. And then let's show the certificate. In this base64 format, we can't really determine much. So what we can do is we can install it and then take a look. Okay, there it is. And as you can see, the issuer and the subject are the same. We successfully created the certificate, and I know I rushed through that demo, but that's because there's going to be an easier way to create a self-signed certificate. New self-signed certificate. That was short and simple, but it didn't really give us any control over what goes into our certificate. Let's then use the new self-signed certificate commandlet with a few more parameters.
First, I'm going to populate my extensions. And here is what, where knowledge of the OIDs will come into play. This one represents the subject alternate name. So I'm going to declare that this certificate is valid for this IP address, as well as this DNS name. You may wonder why I'm also putting an IP address into the DNS name. Well, some clients don't have all the checks implemented correctly, and here we need to uh, have a workaround. I'm setting up some parameters for the subject in distinguished name format. I'm, as always, setting a friendly name. I'm adding my extensions and choosing a provider. This requires a bit of an explanation. Your private key needs to be generated and stored somewhere. There are a number of libraries, um, Microsoft's third parties, which do this. Some protect the key better, like on a smart card. Some keep it in a system's memory. Some will use the TPM chip in a system to generate the private key. Depending on the provider, you will be able to use various algorithms and various strengths of those algorithms. So you have to do your research and determine what is available on your given system. I'm using SHA-2-256, that's pretty secure, and RSA for my uh, key generation. The key length um, should be secure, but not too, um, too long, too large, to be incompatible with um, older client systems. The key export policy will determine whether I can take the private key that's associated with this certificate and move it to another computer system. So I could be essentially creating certificates for many computers. The key protection sets a password on the file that contains the private key, which is good for security, but is not compatible with all applications. That's why I have it set to none over here. You may think of setting other parameters, uh, the not before and not after attributes, which would allow you to control expiration. Let's select everything and run it. And there we go, another self-signed certificate. But I won't show you the full certificate right now. The real test is going to be to see if it works in our first application. First, I should explain what we're about to do. My certificate is issued for the purpose of server authentication. So I'm going to apply it to WS man traffic and to protect my website. In the first case, why is this even necessary? Well, let's take a look. The default configuration for WinRM is to allow Kerberos, um, but that only works in domain environments. If you're going across um, untrusted domains or from a work group into a domain, like I am right now, you're going to be using negotiate authentication, which in this case will drop me down to NTLM. Now, NTLM does not confirm the identity of the server I'm connecting to, and that's a problem. With certificates, if I trust the certificate that has been installed on the server, then I will be um, able to confirm that I'm connecting to the right server. Um, a side note here, because we're using self-signed certificates, um, this isn't going to be uh, the ideal uh, setup. Um, I can install the self-signed certificate in my uh, root CA store and therefore trust it, but this is not something that you would want to do on a larger scale. So let's get started. This is actually pretty simple. There is right now just one listener and it's configured to work on the HTTP port. What I'm going to do is create another HTTP listener. This time working on HTTPS and also bound to just a single IP address. This address must be 
in the SAN extension of the certificate that we're using. I already have the certificate we created on that server, so let's run this. The listener is created, but that's not everything. We need to punch a hole through the firewall to allow that traffic. Now, if you look at the configuration of WinRM, the default port for HTTPS is 5986. So I'm adding an exception to my firewall to open TCP traffic on port 5986. Now I'm going to do this for all network profiles. You should probably uh, do this only for um, say the private profile or your domain profile. Now that that worked, I would typically block the HTTP traffic and disable the uh, existing HTTP listener. Now, of course, what that is going to do is disconnect me from the remote server. Back on my local system, let's try to connect. First, I'm going to test the connection and by specifying use SSL, I am forcing uh, the encrypted connectivity. And there's a problem. The SSL certificate is signed by an unknown certificate authority. To fix this, I would have to add that certificate to my local certificate, uh, root certification authority certificate store. Uh, but again, since this is a self-signed certificate, I may not want to do that. So I can tell the system to skip the check of the CA. If everything else is fine, I'm going to trust the connection. And there we go. We're back online. This server has Internet Information Services installed. I'm going to protect a website that's running on there using my certificate. Now, the certificate is already present in the My Certificate store, right there. But for IIS to pick it up, it needs to be in the Web Hosting Certificate store. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just copying an item. Uh, there is a uh, move item um, uh, commandlet supported by that uh, cert provider, but copy item is not. So we have to do something a little bit more fancy. I'm going to uh, still get the certificate in the same way by uh, listing it from the drive. And then I'm going to create an object of type system security cryptography x509 certificate x509 store that refers to the store in this case the one that I want to uh, populate for the local machine. I'm going to open it for read and write access and I'm going to add the certificate that I retrieved earlier. And that's it the certificate should now be in the proper store. Success. Let's check how IIS is configured at the moment. There's my default website. And it's running on HTTP on port 80. We need to change that. New web binding will allow me to address that website and have it run over HTTPS on port 443. I'm also going to um, distinguish this as the host header so that the system knows what certificate it needs to be using. then 
I'm going to um, get the web bindings again. I have the new entry in here, but I need to add the right SSL certificate to that web binding. I'm identifying the certificate that I've retrieved using its thumbprint. And we should be good to go. Okay, let's test this out. The HTTP version works, of course. If we add HTTPS, it says your connection is not private because we have an error with the certification authority. It's invalid. Of course, this is a self-signed certificate. So what can we do? I saved the certificate to my local drive. Now I can use import certificate to grab that certificate and to put it in the right certificate store. I'll be using my current user, root. This is where root certificate authorities save their certificates. I get a warning, and rightfully so, because as you can see, the key usage for this certificate really says that it should be trusted for server authentication, not for signing other certificates. But let's see what happened. Let's test it again. And hey, it works. And I, our certificate seems to be valid. If that works, can we then use enter PS session into that remote server with SSL, but without the extra CA check? Yay, that also now functions. Now, of course, this is not a recommended setup, but you can see that for testing purposes, it works fine. For our production environment, we will have to try a little bit harder. Why can't we use self-signed certificates for everything? Well, it's a question of trust. Right now, I have a system that I'm requesting services from, and that system has a certificate. So as a user, I trust that certificate to be able to trust that computer. But the question is, how do I trust the certificate? If I trust the issuer of that certificate, which is the computer itself, well, then I already trust the computer directly. So there has to be another element to this. This is the chain of trust. Yes, I will still have to trust someone, but that someone will be a centralized entity. It's going to be a certification authority. The advantage of a um, uh, enterprise CA, especially run on a Windows certification authority, is the ease of distribution of these certificates. Because we're maintaining the entire environment, we have control over who gets what certificates. For trusting systems outside of my organization, I will typically rely on a well-known certification authority. One of the public ones that are published either as part of um, my operating system and its updates, or as part of my web browser and its updates. That certification authority, where I place my, who I place my trust in, uh, sometimes called a trust anchor, is going to be the root CA, which means that it doesn't serve entities underneath it directly. Instead, there's multiple layers. Typically, what we'll have is a policy CA, so that those terms of use 
may be changed without um, recreating the entire trust structure. Sometimes also um, an intermediate CA or multiple intermediate CAs uh, to um, customize these for various environments, various purposes, uh, various security levels. Intermediate. CAs. And then finally, the issuing. CA. And this, as the name implies, issues certificates either to computers and servers, maybe network devices, and also users. The trust, therefore, is transitive. I only have to trust the root CA to be able to trust a given uh, entity. Now, yes, a system or client application, I should say, should um, recognize these layers and should be able to validate a certificate for each of these layers. Because a compromise on any layer of this infrastructure will mean that the certificates underneath are also compromised. It's going to be the job of the client application to validate the certificate for each of these. What has to be checked includes um, the, uh, the naming, so the subject um, should match with the actual system that is out there. Uh, validity dates, uh, the from and to. Um, key usage, that the certificate is not being used for another purpose. Um, excellent example of this is the root CA's certificate uh, should only be used for uh, issuing other certificates. This should not be used for um, signing any content or encrypting anything else. We have to check the validity of um, a certificate against uh, a certificate revocation list or an online certificate status protocol server to make sure that a certificate wasn't revoked because maybe its key was compromised. So a lot relies on the proper implementation of this by the client software. For my production website, I will request a certificate from a well-known certification authority. Let's Encrypt, a nonprofit certification authority, issues certificates for free and does so very quickly as they're only DV. Uh, that means they only prove ownership of the domain. We distinguish DV or domain validation certificates, OV, organization validation, and EV, extended validation. All that's necessary to prove ownership of a domain is access to its DNS server. Let's Encrypt uses the ACME protocol, Automatic Certificate Management Environment, defined in RFC 8555. And they list a number of ACME protocol clients, including PowerShell modules. The module I'll be using has a plugin for Azure DNS to automatically update the entries in there, which is great because that's where I have my DNS and my website. The first thing I will need to do is install the module. Of course, I've done that in the past. So here it is. And just to check, it has the Azure plugin, which will allow me to um, change my DNS entries. Now that plugin requires some login information into Azure and I've already connected to my Azure account. What I will generate is an access token and provide that to the plugin right along with my subscription ID. The other parameters for the commandlet include the DNS name that I want to uh, issue the certificate for. And here this is both a uh, subdomain 
name, and this is going to be the name of my host. The contact information is optional, but I need to accept the terms of service. Let's run that. A data structure like this was returned, but not the actual certificate. What we have is our domain name, a thumbprint of the certificate, but the actual certificate was saved in some files, and we have the path to those files. There's also a password that we will need to use. So let me extract that password. And this one should be pretty simple. Ah, excellent. Now, what got changed in my DNS? I can tell you, not much. The record that was created by the uh, commandlet was then automatically removed. It was only necessary for the time that Let's Encrypt was during, doing the verification of domain ownership. So since this certificate was successfully generated, let's assign it to my app service. Mine is called Grade A Cafe, and I'm going to supply the certificate right along with the password. Let's test it. OK, that works. And my certificate is valid. My final use for these certificates will be to sign some code. Code signing might be required by your PowerShell execution policy. I'm going to retrieve a valid code signing certificate. Notice that the cert drive for the get child item command that supports this special parameter. Let's get that and inspect the important things about it. I have a subject. That's normal. I have a key usage that's entered as key in cipherment. The enhanced key usage is code signing, and I have to have the private key to use this certificate. For this certificate to be trusted by a system, it has to be installed in a number of places. Of course, I have to have it in my certificate store to be able to uh, assign a private key to it and to be able to use it for code signing. But then it has to be in the root certificate store because this is a self-signed certificate, so I have to have that um, trust anchor. And also, to be able to trust code that has been signed or verified using the certificate, it needs to be in the trusted publishers. The rest is pretty simple. Signing is really easy. I'm just going to use the set authentic code signature, supply the certificate, as well as a path to the script. The last thing I'm doing here, which is not mandatory, is adding a timestamp server so that anyone who wants to validate when I signed the file and whether my certificate was valid at the time can do that. Signature verified. Great. There's so much more that you can do with cryptography. App Locker, BitLocker, EFS, ADFS. All these applications could well be their own entire sessions. I hope that this one has been a good introduction into certificates and some of the tools that you can use in PowerShell to manipulate them. Thank you for watching and have a great day.